Next speaker is uh, Aida Todri Samir. Aida received uh, the BS uh, degree in electrical engineering from Bradley University in 2001, MSc degree in electrical engineering from Long Beach State University in California 2003, and PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering from the University of California Santa Barbara in 2008. She is currently a full professor in the electrical engineering department at the Indoven University of Technology, Netherlands, and director of research for the French National Council of Scientific Research, CNRS. Uh, Dr. Todri Samiel was a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Graphene Center and World Wolfson College at the University of Cambridge, UK during 2016 and 2017. Previously, she was an R&D engineer for Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, Illinois. She has also held visiting research position at Mentor Graphics, Cadence Design System, ST Microelectronics, and IBM Watson Research Center. Her research interest focus on emerging technology and novel computing paradigms such as neuromorphing and quantum computing. Thanks, Aida. It's a pleasure to meet you for the for the very first time and the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's also a pleasure for me to be part of Tiny ML, first time also for me. And it's also a great opportunity to follow up after Guy. Um, so uh, indeed, so it's important also to see the various aspects, how the field has developed over the years. And uh, I hope with my talk, I'll give a new um, prospect, a new insight into how we can also uh, perform some of this, um, especially at the edge, such as learning um, with a new computing paradigm based on coupled oscillators or what we call the oscillatory neural networks. So I will start to, to say that probably as the other speakers also have mentioned, uh, we need um, at the edge, especially for edge computing it, where the resources are limited and also most of them are battery handheld. So there is power uh, limitations. We need new computing paradigm that supports online learning. That means to be able to process the data where the data is also being introduced. So to be able without any data transfer. And we need uh, fast and energy efficient computations that also is somewhat scalable. Uh, so we also need to think about the hardware. So the technology behind what would enable this computation at the edge. So the computing paradigm that I've been looking with um, several of with my group, but also with the consortia in Europe, is to look into the collective dynamics of oscillatory neural networks. This is very much a brain inspired computing paradigm. And this is looking into the collective behavior of oscillators, which is also emulating the collective behavior of neurons. So from neuroscience or from biological neural networks, we will have neurons connected via synapses. Our paradigm is to be able to emulate the neuron behavior as an, os as an oscillatory, nor so as an oscillator, which are weakly coupled or strongly coupled among them. So this creates a network of coupled oscillators where we are looking into their collective dynamics. So are they in, in sync? Are they in, um, locked in the same frequency? What is their frequency? And also what are their phase differences between these uh, neurons or oscillators? So this is a new computing paradigm that allows us to encode information in phase. And why this interest is not only this provides this collective dynamics, so the parallelism for computation, but also allows to reduce the voltage. So we are ne no more interested in voltage over time dynamics, like in spiking, where we are looking into the spike rate, but we're interesting, as I mentioned, into the phase. So what is the phase between signals? So to kind of give you a little bit more insight or intuition into this, the ONN computing paradigm, so you can think about they are fully connected uh, oscillators, so we can have a recurrent type of uh, a network. And the information now is encoded on the phase difference between signals. So you can see here the sinusoidal waveforms where we are no longer interested on their amplitude and their rate, but rather than what is their phase difference and can we encode information? So for example, here encode information as a pi difference 
between these two signals. So there are 180 phase degree. That would mean, for example, a logical one. So this is, in an essence, what we are trying to do. We are looking into the phase dynamics, the collective phase dynamics, and the memory. So this system is also behaving as a memory by the coupling between them. So to kind of, again, give you a little bit of think about an image where you have a pixels, and each pixel is an oscillator. So for example, this oscillator here has the yellow uh, type of signal, then the red signal, and then what you, it's important to see that uh, you can immediately see that this is the random initialization of their inputs. And we let the collective dynamics to settle. We have trained the system for learning, for example, as you can see here in black and white. So of, of white would be that they are zero degree. That means they're completely in phase. And black would mean that they are 180 degree out of phase. So we measure the phase differences between these uh, oscillators in order to be able to identify what was, the what was the image that was retrieved? So this is very much um, to whole field neural networks where we can perform a pattern or associative memory, so pattern recognition. What we have done in the recent years, we have actually implemented this digitally where we have um, implemented the, so maybe um, uh, the oscillator. So it can be done in an analog or also with new materials what we have introduced, but recently we have implemented this as a digital phase controlled oscillator. And the synaptic uh, coupling between them is uh, performed by register. So n-bit sign register. And what is important uh, to also mention is that we have also uh, performed uh, off-chip, but also we'll talk a little bit about on-chip learning with these type of neural networks. And we have also implemented on an FPGA to be able to perform also some applications and also to see what kind of, or what would be the added value of computing with ONNs. So as I mentioned, this is a novel computing paradigm, but in nature, it is um, an analog because we are computing with phase or wave-based computing, but we have discretized it in order to be able to compute or to emulate this paradigm on digitally. And um, just to kind of give you a little bit more in-depth to what, what is actually look like this architecture. So you have the oscillators, which as I mentioned, they are uh, phase-based digital oscillators. So they're uh, digitally controlled. And we have the synaptic, so this crossbar is sort of a memory here with based on registers to represent the synaptic weights. And you can see here that they're fully recurrent. And uh, we have also implemented, um, so the synaptic are five-bit signed registers, so we can have positive and negative coefficients. And the maximum size on our uh, Zeebo um, implementation is about 100 neurons. And you will be, um, you know, also surprised that you can do quite a lot, as Guy mentioned earlier, you can do quite a lot even if, with a few neurons. It all depends on how you utilize it or what your network can, can allow. So we showed, for example, here with 15 and 60 type of um, uh, oscillators, so a type of network, the synaptic um, matrix also grows quadratically with a number of oscillators. And we are seeing that the lookup tables quite take uh, a lot of space, but also this grows with the size of the network. And but the computation time of the network is very fast. What is interesting is um, we'll see a little bit later for applications that the massive parallelism of the ONN is actually very interesting for edge, especially when you need to do some real time decisions. And uh, for example, here, just to kind of show you the very first demonstrator, what we did, a 60, we trained a, a, a 60 fully recurrent oscillatory neural network for five, um, for five patterns. So digits, for example, is shown here, zero to four. And we trained it via the unsupervised learning rules, such as Hebian or Storky or Jigit Oper. And what we did was we provide a fuzzy image like this and it is trained to uh, recognize uh, these numbers. And we see after how many cycles, actually in real time, you can see when it converges or recognizes one of the fuzzy patterns. So for example, here uh, on the, you know, we have the phone, which is showing the fuzzy image. We have here our ONN FPGA, which also is showing the output on the screen. So the flipped uh, pixels also represent the, the fuzzy or the oscillators, which are out randomly start at any given uh, phase, but then after a few cycles, they actually converge. So this is also the principle of this um, uh, oscillatory neural networks. And um, 
we also did quite a survey to understand what would be the learning rules and also what are the constraints in if we want to make them uh, if we want to apply on chip learning so some of the constraints in hardware is uh, for especially for ONNs is that we need to have symmetric weight matrix and also the diagonal needs to be zero and we looked into various learning rules so Hebian, Storky, Judith Oper, uh, one and two gardeners and so forth there is also a review paper if you want to look more into it in order to be able to understand which of these uh, learning rules are more suitable for ONN. Because this is a, a new uh, type of uh, neural network, we also need to rethink a little bit about uh, the uh, learning rules, which can also be implementable on the, uh, on the FPGA. So the constraints for on-chip learning, of course, is the learning that have to be local learning rules, meaning that the weight updates of the synaptic is based on the nearest um, uh, the nearest uh, oscillator, and also uh, the incremental learning rules. That means it can continue on to to learn even new patterns. So without this um, 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 drastic forget uh, forgetfulness of the network. So you want to be have this incremental learning rules, but also locally. Uh, and these are the two type of learning rules which actually satisfy the constraints, which also we investigated with ONN on the FPGA. So uh, the a little bit the high level, how does this look into our FPGA, which is a zinc uh, based um, board with an ARM processor in it. So we have this processing part, which we used it for computing the coefficients which then were transmitted via the XI, uh, XI uh, communication to the programmable logic part where the ONN was implemented. And this is in, in, in essence what we have um, uh, tried to understand if we, for example, um, if you have a Storky or Hebian learning rule, what would be the accuracy, but also the latency and performance of the ONN. So here, what we did on the Zebo board, we tried initially for a five by three network. So uh, a small network of uh, 15 oscillators, where we trained it for these three patterns, again, a black and white, because by default, they do this associative memory. So um, and also the white is associated with the zero phase and the black with 180 degree phase. Again, we are computing in the phase and here in digitally, this is also computed via the clock. So we basically have these oscillators that have slow and fast clocks to be able to see it, what is um, their you know, grayscale or representation. So what we provided here is the input, which can come also later on, you'll see on applications, provide, for example, fuzzy, sorry, it's going fast, which is providing these fuzzy images. And at some point, if uh, it's, it has not been learned, then we have also this learning capability in, and also to display what was uh, the output. So we have um, the Hebian learning rules and also Storkin learning rules implemented on the processing. So the PS part of the board and uh, the PLs on the programmable logic, we have the ONN to perform the inference part. So here, what we are showing is the accuracy when we apply uh, on-chip and off-chip uh, learning. So off-chip is when you do this, uh, for example, um, pre-trained already, so you don't do this uh, on-chip. On so we have, uh, you can see the accuracy doesn't change because we apply the same learning rules, so you should not change. Mathematically, it's the same formulation. And uh, what we are seeing in terms of resource is quite a difference. So in terms of the lookup tables, but also flip-flop utilization, we can see, of course, on-chip because they're all pre-trained, uh, the utilization um, is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, off-chip is pre-trained, so utilization is lower. So now we have a 10 degree or uh, of order of magnitude higher in terms of utilization. Again, this is for a small type of network. So we I uh, suspect that this is also something to um, be careful on as we go further into large scale systems, that the resources for on chip learning might be also the limitation factor. And in terms of learning time, so what's interesting to see that the overall, the learning time, the, the computation and transmission, a lot of this is into the transmission. So between the PS and the PL, so between the where the in, uh, learning. Uh, we are computing the learning and then transmitting it to the programmable logic part where the ONN is. So what this is also of interest to see that um, it's not necessarily the computation, but it's the transmission of this uh, data between the two that is causing uh, a further latency. 
And what is important next to, to probably um, also show is that we tried also for different types. So a little bit larger network, 25 narrow, uh, so five by five type of uh, network, but also we tried to um, now look into what would be the weight precision, for example, two bit, three bit, four bit, or five bit type of synoptic precision. And what would that mean in terms of implementation and the learning? So I'm gonna go through some of the analysis that we have recently done uh, with my PhD student in order to be able to also see what are the challenges of applying on-chip learning with ONN architecture. So the first one that we looked into was the precision. So for the 25 um, Neron, we trained it with the random patterns. So we can uh, also distinguish them by their um, hemming distance and also so the various training patterns and what we also put as a threshold, a 90% accuracy. And we can see the difference. So for example, this is for HNN, so whole field neural networks, and this is for oscillatory neural networks. And we also compare the Hepian learning rules versus the Storkin learning rules for an accuracy threshold of 90%, again, for the same size, so five by five networks. And what we are seeing that um, Storky learning rules has a higher, slightly higher capacity than the Hebian. However, in uh, ONN implementation, we, we see a little bit of a difference. And also we see a little bit of a difference also in the weight precision, but not impacting it too much. So this is an interesting analysis to be able to see what would be the best unsupervised, in this case, learning rules to implement on chip, and what would be also the impact of the weight precision. So we are seeing that you know, in this case, for example, uh, uh, Storky or Hebian for ONNs on chip is um, relatively, don't have quite a, a lot of difference, but we can obtain similar results. And the other thing also we looked into, which also makes a difference, uh, is the resource utilization. So adding on-chip learning really increases uh, the resources. So we can see that also as the weight precision. So we can see, for example, um, the number of uh, loots, so lookup tables for on, um, so this is with respect to the in the zinc, and this is in respect to the flip-flops. So we can really see as the number of weight precision increases, so fully and also fully uh, connected neural networks. And it's important to mention again that the the number of connections between oscillators actually grows quadratically. So this also becomes um, uh, something that uh, will, might also limit the amount of how large of a network we can really implement and also what, what kind of on-chip learning capability we can provide. So this is something of a limitation in terms of resources. And latency, this is of interest. So by default, intrinsically, uh, what ONNs is an advantage, is especially for digital, because in analog is also the energy efficiency part, but in digital is the massive parallelism, right? So we have fully connected recurrent neural network. And what we are seeing that the computation part, uh, so we tried this for uh, three bit weight precision, four and five, and also comparing to a previous work that we have implemented last year and the various uh, learning rules and with the weight precision, what we're seeing that is the transmission uh, that it becomes the major uh, bottleneck rather than the uh, computation part. And you can also see here that the transmission also, uh, also grows. So this is for the inference. So the ONN computation time is quite um, minor in, with respect to what we need to do for or the transmission part, and also depending on the weight uh, precision. So this is something that, um, uh, something, so we are trying to identify the knobs. So what would be the most efficient ONN um, and also weight precision to implement to allow this on-chip learning capability, but in the meantime, without overcoming the resources. So we can see that for training a 25 uh, uh, Neron ONN, we can have, for example, 350 microseconds to 150, but the challenge would be what would also the, the specifications or the time specification from the application. So maybe for certain applications, these latencies are quite feasible, but maybe for some others, not really. So in a sense, this is what we were trying to see the limits of the ONN implement of ONN uh, on-chip implementation. And here, let me focus a little bit on the um, on the application part to kind of also give you an idea to, okay, what we can do with this type of neural networks. So here we have a, a small robot that the PhD student Madeleine uh, developed that has uh, eight sensors. And what we are doing is the uh, encode the information from sensors, which are uh, proximity, so infra 
um, time of flight type of sensors that we are actually the proximity we can present it as um, as so for each sensor we have a column and how far is this uh, blockage so um, to avoid we also provide it as a black pixel that means this is the nearest uh, blockage so in this sense we can provide sort of this image black and white uh, by uh, encoding the sensor value so we can have this first um, uh, interpretation of the sensory data into an image that we can easily treat with an ONN, and we use two of them. So the first one is five by eight in order to be able to have to have detect this obstacle. So what is the nearest? And then from there, we reduce to a single row where we can treat from here the direction. So uh, the direction in terms of a one by eight type of network. So only eight neurons. So for example, here, if it's blocked, so that means the right uh, side is blocked. So it means you can go left or straight forward. So this is the type of a system, what it looks like. So you have proximity sensors, that you do I2C reading. So you convert it into an image that you can treat with the first ONN, so 40 neurons. And then you detect the obstacles, which gives it to the second neuron and to a, determine a direction, which can drive the robot. So to a little bit more, uh, so we have the sensor again. So depending on how close is this um, blockage, we can determine that as a column here. So you provide it as a thermometer encoding of those sensor values into an image. And we have trained this first neuron into, um, for example, here, the 256 training patterns to be able to show or to identify this um, environment map. So what is blocked? So what are the, the uh, possible directions? And then from here, uh, we have a second level ONN, which also is determined by only taking a row of the first one and it is trained for all possible patterns. So you can see for left, for right, for forward, for all possible in order to be able to determine then a direction to the robot. So here, um, again, this is done with an Arduino and FPGA, so you can see. And what we have done into it first is um, uh, simply a pre-trained and then with a non-chip learning capability. And the uh, learning rules that we applied are Hebian learning rules, and uh, for, uh, for for simple patterns. So here again, uh, what we did, this is a first, uh, we also, um, we, we encourage you also to look into some of our recent publication, but this is a first development with uh, obstacle avoidance with um, um, on-chip learning capability. So we have a full system that allows this to be able to train. So not the first ONN, but this, uh, the second ONN for patterns. We also have a post-processing algorithm in order to be able, so we have um, uh, the information that is coming from post-processing and also the ONN, which we compare in order to be able to see if there's something else to learn. So maybe there will be, for example, we have not trained um, one of them for um, any of the directions to be able to learn in real time. So this is the two type of solutions. So with the post-processing and with the second ONN that can learn in real time. So based on the environment. So here, for example, is some of the uh, systems uh, specification, what we are seeing for the first ONN because it's pre-trained, is 100%, while the second ONN in order to, have to make a direction, so it's incremental. So it also depends on uh, how many uh, circumstances it has been introduced. For example, the left, the right, or front, or maybe it has to do a turnaround. So this is also depending on the, on the environment. What is important to mention here is that the inference latency, a lot of that latency is from the sensor measurements rather than from the computation time of the ONN. Of course, transmission is always a little bit higher. And we have uh, um, trained it with Hebian, uh, which is un, uh, in this case unsupervised. So it's very also computationally very fast. But the transmission, because it's via the axi, so it's always a little bit higher. What all this also shows here in real time, the input uh, samples through time and when it's learning, because we also have two, um, a robot that is uh, being with prior knowledge and without prior knowledge will show a little bit of uh, what it looks like and also how it is learning in, in real time. We can see that it has this first um, um, inclination and then sort of stabilizing and then learning again and then stabilizing and learning a little bit again. So this is also in a real time what we are seeing. To kind of give you an idea, so this is, for example, a little video of a chip um, uh, ONN with on-chip learning with the prior knowledge. And then we'll also have a little bit of video 
without the prior knowledge. So in order to be able to uh, see the difference as well. So this is obstacle avoidance based on the eight sensors, which are at the front of the robot and is uh, have as, as an Arduino and FPGA, as I mentioned, and operating simply with the uh, ONN, so solitary neural networks and two levels of them. And uh, it's being trained for left, right, and forward, but also you can see that it does certain loops and the next one here, uh, so let me go to the next, this is without. So here we'll take, so you can see what happens in the first 60 seconds. And then afterwards, you'll see the completely different behavior. So it's not knowing, so it's also learning. So it also circles around because it probably doesn't know. And then you'll see a little bit later its behavior when it can go straight or can go forward. Still not there yet. It all depends on the cases, on the exploration of the space. And then now we can start to proceed a little bit more rather than spinning on itself. So we can see that its behavior it can go, yeah, so it's learning new, um, can explore the space a little bit more. So yeah, in an essence, what would happen in real, again, this is short little videos, just to show how you can enable this uh, learning capability on this type of very small uh, neural networks. And um, sorry, yeah. So as, as an essence to this on-chip learning, what we are witnessing is that uh, we don't need necessarily quite a lot of um, large networks, but we need uh, more if, in terms of to bring the on-chip. So how to compute this um, coefficients uh, on-chip. So basically on the processing part, we are seeing that we are running out of the uh, lookup table. So resource utilization is a challenge. And also this is very much dependent on the weight precision, depends also on the connectivity of the network. Maybe for some applications, the fully connected networks is not necessarily needed. So sparsity can be another knob to be played. And the next uh, step that we are currently also working on is in improving scalability. So going to larger networks and also maybe finding more efficient way of how to implement this on chip on the processing side, maybe also bringing it on the PL side, on the programmable logic. So this is something that is currently ongoing. And other applications, we are also, you know, other on robotics application, but maybe for other type of applications uh, where this kind of on-chip and real-time decisions are important. I also want to say that this work is done very much in collaboration uh, in Neuron project uh, with various partners and also a new project we just started, Fast Track as well, which the idea is to go and take this computing paradigm a little bit further and to understand um, what are its advantages or pros and cons and for what type of applications it will actually be more meaningful to bring an added value, not only in energy efficiency, but also on the functionality part. So with that, maybe I would like to um, uh, wrap up and uh, uh, thank you for your attention and maybe take some questions. Thank you, Dai, uh, your, uh, your presentation. There are several takeaways from, uh, from your talk. Uh, I was quite impressed about uh, the latency that uh, is uh, unchanged between learning and, and normal operations. Uh, the networks that you presented in terms of bit depth uh, are very low. I call them a deeply quantized neural network. So couple these with a few neurons, which uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's positive to, to devise neural networks with a few neurons, so the simpler is the better. What about applicability for incense or computing? It means that Super integration within the sensor of such uh, neural network even So, if I understood, there is a little bit of an audio issue. So, if I understood, is the integration of such networks with sensors? Is that right? Or maybe yeah, I missed in the same package, in the same ah. package with ah. the close, very close to the sensing element. Ah. Very, very good. Uh, that's an excellent question. And um, so, because 
Oscillatory neural networks by nature, intrinsically, they are analog computations, right? So we compute with waves. So we compute in um, frequency domain to understand the phases. Sensors um, also provide analog signals. So in an essence, now we have an opportunity to be able to have in-sensing computing because we have analog signals and analog computing. So um, in, in an essence, we, sh we shouldn't even need uh, analog to digital conversion. So, in, so that also brings this uh, additional merit in terms of energy efficiency and power consumption. But the proof to have how you can um, uh, indeed uh, analog signals into analog inputs into uh, oscillatory neural networks, this is something we are currently also uh, into fast track. So the, the previous, um, you know, the project that I was just referring to. So this is indeed a, one of the added value where this analog computation or computing paradigms can be of value and can be a, a game changer for edge computing, not only in energy efficiency, but to be able to have in-sense computing. This is something that uh, we are currently working, but I think also the community is looking into. Definitely, especially the company that produced pencils. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Please go on. No, no, no. That's yeah, indeed. Yeah. I think it can be especially for edge computing where you want to be able to train online. You want to be able to have this um, capability to uh, adapt to environment, learn from the environment. So this incremental learning, maybe reinforcement learning. Uh, I talked so far about um, you know unsupervised, right? But we still have a problem with reinforcement. How we can actually implement that? So these are also some of the paths we are currently exploring. And um, you know, if someone from the audience is interested to know more, you know, feel free to reach out. But these are really paths that um, we are trying to also see what learning rules would be the most suitable for this reinforcement or incremental learning for ONN. So these are all very open questions. Excellent. Uh, there is a question uh, from the floor. What is what are the benefits and pros of using uh, uh, ONN in comparison to uh, spiking neural network? A very good question. So first of all, it's a completely different uh, paradigm in terms of how we encode information. So in spiking, in SNNs, we really are interested on the spike rate. So we see how frequently and in and after you know certain threshold we know that the neuron fired or not so we don't have the same requirements with oscillators we have free running uh, oscillators or clocks if you want to call that in digital and we are comparing so if you have to to think about signals you need in snn you need to to, to have to look for uh, in time domain to see when that rate uh, when that's uh, when uh, these spikings are uh, occurring, how frequently they're occurring. Well, for us, we're simply comparing two signals. We are checking uh, in what phase degree difference they are from one another. So we are completely doing two mathematical functions uh, that are different from one another. So, and also because of this, it also um, simplifies somewhat the computational um, complexity of the network. You see also in terms of hardware implementation. So encoding for us is in phase, well in uh, SNNs it's in spiking rate. So I think this is uh, fundamentally different and also um, we can uh, we can also have an oscillatory uh, SNN which is maybe a combination of the two. But this is something also uh, currently that we are exploring but you know fundamentally they are complete uh, they are two different um, uh, mathematical formulations as well. Very good. Uh, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Ida, for your uh, outstanding presentation. It was very informative. Personally, I learned a little bit more about oscillatory neural network, which I didn't know before. Thanks. Uh, all the tiny ML operations are possible thanks to the strategic partners, which are uh, providing the support and commitment uh, to make uh, to keep. Uh, successful all the operations, the different events that uh, can in condition of the night. So thanks to IZIP, Analog Devices, Arduino Arm, Brainship, IG Impulse, Greenway, Technology Groverty, IBM, ImageBob, Infineon, Inatera, Microsoft, Not AI, NXP, Polling Technology, Pixel, Falcom, Renaissance, Schneider Electric, Sensing, Sony, Silicon Labs, Steam Electronics, Synaptics, Intian. Then our ex executive strategic partners, Edge Impulse, 
as we said, Qualcomm, Sintient, the Platinum One, which are Renaissance, uh, then uh, Aetrios, Gold Strategic Partners uh, are Analog Devices, Arduino, oops, Arm AI, Infineon, Innatera, Microsoft, Sensimil, ST Microelectronics, Synaptics, and the Silver Strategic Partners, as we said before, IZIP, BrainChip, Greenway Technology, Groverty, IBM, ImageMob, Not AI, NXP, Polyin Technology, Quixo, Snyder Electric, and Silicon Labs. Uh, all the uh, rights are reserved to the Tiny ML Foundation. And uh, thanks again for your time, for your passion, also the extra time.